Okay, so our first section is uh, the kidneys and the urinary system. Uh, so the urinary system is also known as the excretory system. Um, the kidneys, as you can see over here in this diagram to the right, there are these two um, sort of oblong organs on either side of the body. They're responsible for the removal of metabolic waste um, in humans that comes in the form of urea. That's the nitrogenous waste I was talking about before. Um, and it can also remove bicarbonate, sodium, and water as well, um, among a couple of other smaller, smaller molecules. So blood enters the kidney through the renal artery, because as we know, um, artery car arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart and uh, to the target tissue. So the renal arteries target tissue is the kidney. Um, it brings it in and then purified blood leaves the kidney and re-enters the body, the systemic circulation through the renal vein. So waste products, ions, uh, and water are absorbed by the kidney and are directed to the ureters. So you can see uh, the kidneys over here and then these two sort of yellow tan um, tubes that are coming off of each of them leading to the bladder are called the ureters. So we have two of them um, and both the kidneys empty into one bladder. So the ureter descends from each kidney and empties into the bladder. Um, and when the bladder fills, uh, it's lined with these uh, receptors called stretch receptors, and they send signals to the pons, which is a part of the brain that we've discussed uh, before in our previous lectures. Uh, the pons has uh, what we refer to as the urination center. And um, when it receives that message um, from the bladder that it's full, it communicates with the cortex a little bit farther up in the cerebrum. So if the context is appropriate, if we're in the appropriate context to urinate, the parasympathetic nervous system allows for a contraction of smooth muscle around the bladder and a relaxation of the internal sphincter. So uh, it's sort of like a simultaneous thing. Uh, when the bladder fills up, uh, the smooth muscle is involuntary, remember? It's dominated by the uh, para, it's, I'm sorry, it's dominated by the autonomic nervous system. Um, and specifically the parasympathetic section of the nervous system. So it contracts the smooth muscle around the bladder, which expels, um, it pushes the urine downward. And then the internal sphincter is one of two sphincters that we have. Uh, the internal sphincter is also involuntarily controlled. So that's also mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, the external sphincter is actually, uh, we do have motor control of it because it's uh, striated muscle, so it's voluntary. Um, so that's, that's the sphincter that we control to release urine. Uh, urine flows past the internal and then the external sphincter, um, and then out the body through the urethra. So that was sort of like a macro view of the urinary system. So we're going to zoom in on the kidney a little bit. I put another diagram over here to the left. So um, once the blood makes it to the kidney, um, it's carried to the kidneys via the renal artery, as we were talking about before. And um, the outer region of the kidneys is known as the cortex. So uh, a lot of structures, you'll see uh, cortex and medulla. Cortex usually refers to the outside of it and medulla refers to the inside. So it's kind of just like the brain. I mean, we have a cortex and we have a medulla in there. Um, so just think about that if you ever get confused, which is which. Uh, the outer region is the cortex. Uh, the cortex is the uh, outer region of the kidney, which has an ion concentration isotonic to that of plasma. So uh, the cortex tonicity, the uh, solute concentration, is basically uh, the same as plasma. And we're going to talk a little bit later about why that's important, but I'm sure if you're familiar with osmosis, then you can already pretty much you know, understand why. Uh, so in the cortex, you will find the glomerulus and the convoluted tubules, which are two different parts of the nephron. Um, they are toward the beginning when uh, the filtrate just enters the lumen. Uh, so the inner regions of the kidney, which are right over here, these uh, darker, like sort of pinkish areas, uh, that's known as the medulla. That's the innermost part. It's the striated inside of the kidney, and it has a hypertonic concentration compared to its surroundings. So the medulla is very salty. It has a very high solute concentration, um, and that later we'll see that it helps pull water out of uh, the nephron. So the difference in tonicity between the cortex and the medulla is essential for proper kidney functioning, like I just said. And uh, urine leaves the nephron after it goes through everything, which we'll talk about in just a minute. It leaves the nephron and passes through the renal papilla into the calyx. So that's right over here. If you take a look at one of these triangles of the medulla, the renal papilla is that connection right between there and the calyx. Um, the calyx is just this opening that empties into the renal pelvis. So there, you could see that there are multiple medulla 
throughout the entire thing. They're constantly filtering your blood. Um, they're making filtrate and it's pouring separately. Each uh, medulla is pouring separately into the renal pelvis and then the renal pelvis makes its way out of the kidney and into the ureter. Um, so someone asked me how many questions about the types of receptors are on the MCAT. You might not see too many that are specifically asking you about the receptors, but they pop up. Um, you should know, you know the difference between mechanoreceptors versus chemoreceptors versus nociceptors. Um, so they're not going to explicitly ask you. I wouldn't say there probably will be no, no questions on the MCAT that are just specifically asking you to identify them. Um, but sometimes in the context of your reading or if you're answering a question about something else, you will need that knowledge in order to answer it. So I would definitely know it. Uh, there's not, there aren't too many, there aren't too many to know. So it wouldn't, it's not too hard to, to spend too much time. I think it's worth knowing. And when you say convoluted tubules, are you talking about proximal and distal ones? Yes, I am. And we're going to go over that right now. I believe all of that is on the next slide. <clears throat> 